So today, I would like to share with you our efforts in empowering motor disabled people to go beyond their physical body borders, and this by mentally controlling neuroprotective devices as this wheelchair that they can drive, or by controlling exoskeletons in order to regain the capability to do grasping and walking again. So this technology is called a brain-machine interface that essentially analyzes in real time people's brain waves and translate those mental intentions that people have at any time into the commands that those machines will be executing for them. And how does a brain-machine interface work? Well, essentially, there are two main components. The first one is that the fact that people are sending mental commands and delivering mental commands to the machine means that they are observing, they are receiving some kind of feedback of whether or not their intentions were correctly decoded by the machine. And this will allow them to voluntarily, and this is key, everything happens because you wish so to happen, they will voluntarily learn how to modulate the brain signals so as to be better understood by the machine. The other component is that the machine, too, will learn which are the prototypical patterns of brain activity in each of the subjects that are associated to the different mental commands that they want to deliver. So this means that we have two learning agents, the user and the machine. They need to get coupled in order to learn from each other. Normally, we use non-invasive electro uh, electroencephalogram. This is the cap that my colleague Robert Leap is wearing. There are electrodes integrated in the cap, and these electrodes will be non-invasively from outside the head measuring that brain activity. But we can also measure the brain activity using implanted electrodes in people's brain. So let me show you an example of Robert's brain waves. So at the VR, with the BRI, you cannot recognize anything. But what you can see there is that this signal is a fluctuating signal that is modulated by two components. The first one is the mental command that the user wants to deliver to the machine here and now. But on top of that, um, most of the times, even with a much larger amplitude, so much bigger, there is another component. And this component is the background activity of your brain. What does it mean? Well, none of us is capable to focus our attention for a long period of time on a single task and keep it at a very high level. Your attention will start oscillating with time. You will switch from one thing to another. And those fluctuations will be reflected in your background activity. What does it mean? That then we cannot achieve perfect brain control over long periods of time? Well, in a given sense, Yes, we can't, because we cannot decode the reliably all the information from our brain. However, we can still control reliably machines. And for that, we have developed a series of principles. And today, I will focus only on two of them. The first is the fact that we confuse the intelligence of the person as communicated through the brain-machine interface with intelligence of our neuroprocessing device, like this wheelchair. This wheelchair is intelligent because sometimes it will be capable to compensate the eventual decline of mental control that the user may have at certain times. What do I mean by that? What I mean is that the mental commands of the person will be shaky, but the wheelchair, for example, have some 
webcams that will be observing your environment, will be detecting the objects so as to avoid crashing with obstacles, or if your intention is so, to approach the person you want to engage in, a, in an interaction with in the proper way. It will allow you to navigate safely and efficiently as long as you have a sufficient level of mental control. But you don't need to have perfect mental control all the time. The second principle that we use is the fact that while you are sending commands and receiving feedback, you are also monitoring the quality of the interaction. Are things going well? How much attention do I need to pay? It is too slow, it is too fast. Now, if we can derive from the analysis of the very same brain signals that we are using to command the machine, which is the cognitive state of the subject, then we can modulate the interaction and make it easier for the subject. So, to illustrate this, I would like you to help me. I will propose you a game. Do you want to play a game? Not over there. You don't play the game? Do you play the game? OK, very good. So, the game is very simple. You will be seeing here pictures. The pictures will go very fast. One picture per second. And the game is simply, let me do this, to clap whenever you see an animal. You see an animal, you clap. Human beings are animals. You clap. <laughs> there is no animal, you don't clap. But for the game to succeed, you need to be very fast. So, ready? Because you need to be fast. Let's go. All the animals. Okay, that's enough, that's enough. <laughs> I hope you have experienced the... Oops! <laughs> I am wrong. And you know that you are wrong immediately. Actually, if I look at your brain, milliseconds, nothing, after you have started the movement. However, this is not enough to stop your action. But this is for another talk. <laughs> the important thing is that whenever you perceive and you are aware, again, key thing, you are aware, nothing happens without your active involvement. You are aware that there is an error, either because you have made the, an error or your brain-machine interface has not decoded your intention correctly. There is a signal that says peak error that we can detect in real time in order to prevent those wrong actions to be executed. Now, enough of blah, blah. Let's go to the meat. Let me introduce you our telepresence robot. <clears throat> that Robert is mentally controlling from here. The robot is in Lausanne, in our lab so that I can check whether my students are working or not. <laughs> <clears throat> it seems. So, the important thing is that Robert, from here, will be driving mentally the robot as if he was there. On that bar that you see moving, we are visualizing Robert's mental intention so that if the, ro the, the bar reaches the right end or the left end, he will be sending the command to the robot, turn towards the right or the left. And if the bar is in the middle, he doesn't want the robot to change in direction. He, he wants the robot to keep moving straight. So it seems that the robot is a little bit lost. So, Robert, can you bring it to the left, please? No, to better to the right, because otherwise you will enter into that other room, and we will not see it. 
Sorry, I, I, tell, I told you to, to go the other side. Up. Okay, you are bringing back the robot. And you can see that the robot has some cameras so that eventually he is capable to avoid crashing against obstacles. In that case, the robot says, okay, from here I cannot move away, I need some assistance. Okay, here it is, you are moving to the other side. That's enough. Now, <clears throat> now, the point I want to make is that, in order to start concluding, is that we have been engaged for some time now, and we are continuing, some tests with disabled people who suffer from different kinds of motor disabilities. And all of them have shown to be capable to control all these neuroprosthetic devices, the wheelchair, this telepresence robot, even orthosis to allow them to regain grasping, with high fidelity and with the same level of performance as healthy people, because their brain is intact. Their body can't do many things, but their brain is as efficient is not more than yours or mine. And we can even think, sorry, we can even think of applying all this research beyond the domain of disability. For example, in a recent project with Nissan, we are starting to explore how we can use this technology together with intelligent cars in order to improve the driving experience, because those cars, as our wheelchair, have sensors, have some degree of autonomy. Please don't take it me wrong. We are not pretending to drive only by the brain. We want drivers to keep using their body. We have listened to this gentleman saying, use your body, because if you use your body, you will have better brains. So please, Keep using your body. The important thing is that whatever your body does comes from here. And if we can detect which is your mental intention before you execute it, we can prepare the car much better for you. Still, the big challenge, the biggest challenge that we have is to help recovering motor discapacities. And this will only happen if we can achieve the dream of mental control of full body exoskeletons, where you will be controlling every single part of your body that you don't have control any longer. This will keep us busy for many years to come, but I guarantee we will succeed. Thank you very much for your attention. <clears throat>